Norman Mailer is here. His first novel, The Neck End of the Dead, sold 200,000 copies. It made him one of the most celebrated post-war literary figures at the tender age of 25. Since that time, he has written more than 30 books. He has won two Pulitzers. He has directed four films, and he has written 10 screenplays. His new book is called The Spooky Art, Some Thoughts on Writing. Its publication coincides with his 80th birthday, January 31st. I am pleased to welcome Norman Mailer back to this table for a conversation about everything. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, July 31st is the right day, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 80. 80, yeah. What's it like? Oh, ask me when I'm 90. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Old age is odd. It, it has its advantages. Yeah. You, you kind of settle down in one funny way, which is you don't get angry at quite as many things in a given day, mm -hmm. and you don't feel as much of a sense of frustration at all the things you haven't become. Well, tell me about that, because you have I mean, I've read your thoughts on that. This idea of saying, I know what I'm not going to be, and I'm okay by what I am. Well, you're never okay with what you okay, are, if yeah. you, but, but, but generally speaking, you, you, you've come to accept the fact that you probably are what you are. In other words, you're not thinking, I don't think any longer, maybe I ought to go back to politics. Yeah. Uh, maybe I uh, should have been this. Why, why could I never become the skier I wanted to be? Yeah. I don't think about those things anymore. All I think about is the one thing I ever was really good at was writing. And so and, when you uh, think about that, what do you think other than well, this I book? book I'm, yeah, right. I have a book I'm working on, a novel, a big novel. Mm -hmm. uh, bigger possibly than I am. In other words, I may finish the novel or the novel may finish me, but <laughs> at 80 you can't start making predictions. Uh, Saul yeah. Bellow wrote a very good novel at 84. What was it called? Uh, uh, Ren don't Ren ask me, because yeah, I, know, right. I have no. an 80 year old memory. Okay. The point is what, that, that he was writing well at, at, 85. at 85. Yeah, <laughs> that's my point. That gives a hope. Uh, because you don't want to, you know, you, obviously you have less writing ability in terms of speed of hand, so to speak, yeah. and fire and smoke when you, when you get older. The punch but is not as hard and, and it's not it, as fast. It's a slower. You see the opening and you don't take it. Yeah. Uh, the equivalent of that in novel writing, I don't quite know, but it's, it just takes you longer to get to the same place. And uh, on the other hand, you know more. And, and, so you, you, and you have a wonderful sense of the pitfalls, which I didn't have when I was younger. So is it better or on balance it's even? On balance, it's not quite even, but it, you have a good enough fighting chance so that you're going to willing to take on something big. I mean, mm -hmm. I could spend the next 10 years doing very small, good books built on books I've written already. And I might end up having to do that yet. I don't know. But I don't want to do that first. I, want to make, I really want to make an all-out attempt to write one more big novel, bigger than any I've done before. I promise you it won't come out in one book if it's that big. It'll yeah. come out in four books. Well, but what do you think is the biggest thing you've done so far? I'd say uh, Harlot's Ghost and uh, The Executioner's Song and Ancient Evenings, those three books. Are the things that you're proudest of and you think you Yeah, that I think, I think in a hundred years from now, if any of them is going to last, it might be one of those three rather than The Naked and the Dead. Really? Well, The Naked and the Dead will always last in a certain sense because it's, it it, it's a portrait of, of war and people are always interested in that. Hmm. Even if there's no war in a hundred years, which is highly unlikely, but... Uh, if, because we may not be around, <laughs> uh, but if there is no war in a hundred years, then people might be interested in war still. So, so the Naked and the Dead may last, but I don't think it's the best of the books I've done. No. Speaking of war, what do you think of this talk of an well, Iraqi I listened, invasion? Well, I listened to the speech uh, last night, good part of it, and uh, it was marvelously crafted. God, they've gotten smart, those Republicans. Yeah. They used to be so stupid. I think it's Bush. I think he lucked. Uh, he you, you think he's the smart one? No. no I think it's no, Cheney. No, and no, 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 no. Well, I don't think he's as uh, dumb as you, you might suggest. I, mean, I think I, he's I less to... dumb than he used to be. People who are dumb, who hang around very bright people, do get brighter sometimes. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, especially I'm not if they're the boss. I just think there is a difference, and uh, you have thought about this, I'm sure, in kinds of intelligence and, and I mean, in terms of different kinds of intelligence, number one, and so I find it difficult to pigeonhole people in terms of how bright they are. Number two, uh, he may not be, he might, as Bill Clinton says, be one of the best politicians of our time. Well, it's one of the few times I can agree with Bill Clinton. He, <laughs> no, he's an extraordinarily good politician. And he knows, he really knows the sodden underbelly of noble American emotion. Yeah. Did you read that piece by Bill Keller in the New York Times Magazine comparing him to Reagan over the weekend? Uh, yeah, I did, but uh, Keller has been very odd lately. I, I don't want to discuss Keller. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. he, 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 he's soft where you expect him to be hard, and he's hard where you expect him to be soft. Well, and, that's unpredictable. And, uh, that's good, I thought. I mean, I'm speaking, like, I'm speaking like a woman at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> but, no, but Keller's not someone who attracts my attention. 
Yeah. Uh, Maureen Dowd, yes, because sometimes I know what she's going to say and sometimes I don't. Sapphire, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, you always know what Sapphire is going to say, don't you? Yeah, but it's always got a hard... Because it comes back to the same... You have, you have to argue with them when you read them, which isn't bad. And, of course... Uh, That's a good test of a good column, if you want to argue with it. Yeah, oh, yeah. And then, of course, uh, uh, there are, the guy who writes on economy... Here I go again. Paul Krugman. Absolutely. He's, you he's like a him? splendid columnist. Yeah. yeah. What novels do you like today? That I never answer. I got in such terrible trouble for so many years, <laughs> venting my opinions on all my contemporaries, <laughs> that my life has been singularly free of good writers who are deep friends. <laughs> well, but they they don't want to be near me. What if I write about them? <laughs> so in, in my approaching old age, my feeling is, I'm not going to make comments on writers anymore unless I'm truly feeling strongly about it. Not in conversation, not in print, not in anything. Not even in conversation. Really? But certainly not on the air. Yeah. Well, certainly not, not, not on the unless, air. Not unless I'm absolutely serious about, about well, the, the well, comment. Well, pick one you can say something good about. Well, uh, the only one I can say anything good about at the moment, oh, I can say very good things about my three, uh, uh, the three stooges uh, that uh, <laughs> Tom Wolfe uh, called the three stooges, yeah. to which John Irving, John Updike, and myself. Yes. <laughs> I can say excellent things about those about three. About Updike? Oh, Updike, yeah, yeah, I respect Updike. Yeah. I don't respect him beyond my own my respect for myself, but I yeah. do respect him. Would, uh, Philip Roth, uh, Bellow. Yeah, I do uh, too. Yeah, all of those. They're all very good. Um, uh, William Kennedy is terrific. Um, uh, we go down to Lilo. There are an awful lot of very good writers around now. And I know I've missed a few. On okay, but you put Larry your... McMurtry. There are any number of very good writers around. It's just that none of us really are great. Great enough for what this country needs right now which is a few great novelists who could change the, the, the stupidities with which we're ridden now. When was the last time we had that in our history? This past sense used to do it. Uh, Faulkner had that quality. Uh, Hemingway, in a funny way, changed American life profoundly. Not always in ways one would admire, necessarily, but he had the power to change American life. How did he change it? Oh, everybody in terms of the coverage better. of the war? because He made us aware of the fact, uh, made sensitive men aware of the fact that courage was an absolute virtue. Yeah. And that you couldn't ignore a lack of courage in yourself. Most people believe that you patterned yourself after Hemingway. I was influenced by him. I was influenced by that thought. But no, I wouldn't try to pattern myself after Hemingway because, for one thing, he, he wrote brilliantly and wonderfully well, but he wrote in a different way than, than I write. He had a different kind of mind. I, I'd be silly to pattern myself uh, well, after Hemingway. Pattern is a bad word, bad choice uh -huh. of words. Uh, you look to him as, a, as an example Spiritual father. Yeah, exactly. You and know, then he committed he suicide. A, he, uh, yes, so because that, he could not live with the absence of his faculties. I think that's probably true. He was not about to be there a doddering old man. Yeah. He just wasn't. But even Is so, that courage or not? I don't know. Maybe not. I've always wanted to think that he didn't go in that room that night to commit suicide. He went in there for his cure. And the way he saw his cure was he would take this double barrel shotgun put his thumb on it, or a finger, or whatever, and press down on it, that he may have done it 20 times before the death occurred. And then he would see how deeply he'd go into this air trigger mechanism before he'd release it, daring death that way, you see. And uh, this night it didn't work, and the gun went off. Mm. Have you played a kind of Russian roulette with your life in any way? Well, not, uh, not that way, no. I don't, not, mean, I don't mean physically with a gun, but I mean in terms of where you have taken risk in which... Uh, if there'd been a gun in the barrel, it'd been over, you know, that kind of thing. No, I think I've, I've taken certain kinds of risks that uh, were not small. <coughs> Two of them were uh, ancient, evening, uh, ancient Evenings, Ancient right. Egypt. Right, right, I agree. Uh, which was a very tough book to write and took 11 years, damn it. I know. And Harlot's Ghost took seven years. And, and when I started it, it was a bold book because I was going to try to write, write about the CIA as if they were people rather than a noble, exalted, patriotic institution. And uh, by the time I finished the book, uh, the CIA was on the downward path. It had lost its luster for Americans. So a book that was, took a certain amount of moxie in the beginning needed less by the time I finished it. Whether it's Graham Greene or whether it's uh, John Le Carre and a variety of others, what is it about spies that attracts us? Is it because it's a house of mirrors in which you don't know what the truth is and therefore you're, what is it? Well, I think anyone who's ever had any kind of double life 
even if it's an imaginary, even if one half the double yeah. life is an imaginary double life. Even if it's cheating on your spouse or whatever it might be? Even if it's even cheating on your mental loyalty to your yeah, spouse. Yeah, exactly. But anyone, anyone who has this sense of a double life is always fascinated with spies, with actors, criminals. Yeah. Anyone who's had a change of identity, an identity crisis, uh, is going to be interested afterward in similar people. And anyone who's a spy have, absolutely has to have an identity crisis that they've mastered. Anyone who is a spy has gone through an identity crisis and they've mastered it. Yes, Be a successful spy. Yeah. Yes. Have you ever had an identity crisis? Oh, sure. Right after the Naked and the Dead. Did you really? Because well, I, I was a simple kid. You're 25 years Brooklyn. old and you were ne then celebrated nationally. Yes. And I was, wasn't at all ready for it. I didn't know yeah. what the hell it was all about. And I didn't know how to behave. Yeah. When you don't know how to behave, you're having an identity crisis. Yeah. When you look back at 80, Norman Mailer's life has been in pursuit of what? Oh, a great novel. That's, easy. That's one question I can always answer. I always wanted to write a great novel. And you haven't? Well, not my idea of a great novel. I've written some very good novels, I think. Yeah. Uh, but what, what's the difference? I mean... The difference is a great novel changes people's lives in ways they can't even begin to measure. In, in this book, one of the things I mentioned in passing is uh, who was not bored at one point or another in reading, and then list all the great novels. Yeah. Uh, Moby Dick... Uh, uh, the Magic Mountain. Yeah, I go through all of them. Yeah, I know you do. And, and you're saying what? And what I say is we've all been bored in part by every one of those books because they are saying new things to us that are somewhat disturbing. And so there's a tendency to turn off as you read. You see, a book that's a fast read, that's an absolutely agreeable fast read, is usually a meretricious book. A meretricious? Meretricious, yes. It may be meretricious at a high level. Yeah. It may sell hundreds of thousands of copies. But there's usually something wrong with the depth of perception of it. I agree. If it's easy, it, it, it's kind of forgive me, but it's kind of, for interrupting. But it's kind of like uh, <laughs> Mac, uh, McDonald's food. We have a huge equivalent of McDonald's food in the literary world, which is a certain kind of uh, bestseller, huge bestseller, whose taste you can detect in advance. Is this so obvious as to say that any great art is a struggle? If that's a fair remark, always. It, 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 uh, does it have to be a struggle? Almost always. But I'm sure there are examples we can think of. That uh, didn't fit uh, that, but it was good. Anyway. Maybe, maybe Pride and Prejudice is, does not require a great deal of struggle. However, if you have a lot of, if you're very interested in manner and society and how genteel people sure. live, you can get into some real complications with Pride and Prejudice. But generally speaking, I would say that's not a hard or difficult read. But, but uh, most great writers are not easy to read and shouldn't be. Why haven't you written a great novel in Norman's judgment? i.e. one that Because I have a very, I put that idea of a great novel at a very high I, level. I did, and that's why I said in yeah. Norman's judgment. I didn't mean that other things that you have written, certainly in terms of political committees or in terms of your colleagues or in terms of uh, people who appreciate literature wouldn't say this is either great or approaching great, but I knew your standard was higher and different. Yeah, well... So what's the answer why you haven't done it? Well, I've done my best. It's just my best have may you? not have been... Yes, with all the vices that everyone has in their character. <laughs> when you do your best, it doesn't mean that you were doing your best every damn day. Hell no. Oh, no, no. No, you were just doing your best given your liabilities and your limitations. Uh, uh, and, uh, Charlie, you're bringing out my southern accent. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I served in North Carolina. It, at, uh, at, at Fayetteville. At, at Fayetteville, Fayetteville, Fort, Fort Bragg. Bragg. Yeah. yeah, Fort Bragg. And then you could have gone down to Camp Lejeune and been with the Marines. I mean, they're, they're, and there's I an air... I wasn't ready for the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> there's an Air Force base uh, in, in It'd be easier for me to be a Marine Corps general than to be a Marine Corps <laughs> private at you this were. point. Yeah. <laughs> it, this is what you quote, uh, and uh, this is what I want to quote. You quote Thoreau in journals as saying, I was never so rapid in my virtue, but my vice kept up with me. We are double-edged blades, and every time we wet our virtue, the return stroke straps our vice. Yes, yeah, beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So the two That's are together. <laughs> <laughs> you also, why do you quote this from Joyce? Every other person I know either likes Joyce or doesn't. Yeah, I like Joyce. Yeah, right, don't you, do you, don't you find that every other person seems to me either likes him or doesn't? Uh, uh, the ignorami, ignorami, do not like Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Joyce, a painful case. He lived at a little distance from his body, regarding his own acts with doubtful side glances. He had an odd autobiographical habit, which led him to compose in his mind from time to time a short sentence about himself. It's, it's uh, in one paragraph, one short paragraph, he captures the nature of a young writer. 
I mean, I not only recognized myself in that one short paragraph, but I thought of all the young writers I'd known when I was a young writer and how much it was true for us. Writers are not like other people. Good novelists are just not like other people. I could see someone who's not a good novelist could have an average character. That's a bad novelist could have an average character. They just happen to be in writing. It's the way that certain doctors who are not particularly healers, they just happen to be in medicine. They paid their dues. They went to school, etc. So by the same token, there are any number of writers who, who've worked at writing to the point where you, you can work at writing and learn to write a novel. It doesn't mean it's going to be a good one. But uh, someone had to be pretty stupid before if I were a teacher, I would fail to try to instruct them to write a, a decent, mediocre mm -hmm. novel. Okay, but what is it about the novel that you put up on such a high pedestal? It's that the finest moral judgments are not to be found in science, in psychoanalysis, uh, in social work, uh, or in the clergy. Or in journalism or whatever. Journalism goes by the board. We don't have to worry about that. <laughs> journalism is not built to give fine moral judgments. All right. It's built to give the best quick moral judgments that are it's available. A, the first writing of whatever. To a bunch of people who are prejudiced in the first place. Okay. But why a novel? I mean, I, I want to get back to novels. It's the highest what? Well, it's... It, it offers the highest challenge for moral inquiry. In other words, the, the finest moral assessments of, of, of experience and of behavior can be found in the novel. Look back through history of civilization, mm -hmm. and you will determine, and you will come to the conclusion that the most rigorous and highest examinations of, mor of morality have been done in novels. Well, the novel's only 300 years old, okay. so that, let's say for the last 300 years. That's the example, yeah. The earlier examples were, were the great theologians, uh, Aquinas, Augustine, uh, a few of the others, Maimonides, uh, uh, Luther, uh, uh, Bishop uh, Vox, William of Oxen, you know, Oxen's Razor. Uh, you, there were great moralists in the Middle Ages. There were great moralists at the time of Christ. There were great moralists at the time of the Hebrew prophets. There were doubtless great moralists in, in Islam that I don't know mm. about. But at a certain point, the novel came into existence. And when you are a theologian and a moralist, your end is to a certain extent foretold. You have to come out on the side of God one way or the other. It's only the novelist who can say, what if God is not all good and all powerful? What if God is possibly all good but not all powerful, or all powerful but not all good? It's almost impossible for a theologian to think that way. But that's the way we think in life. One of the most commonest remarks in life is, how could God, how could you do this yes. to me? Yes. Or how could God allow that? Or how that, could you be good if you did this? Or how could you be good if you allowed this? Yes, yes, yes. No, no God would allow AIDS. Yes, well, all of it, AIDS, the Holocaust, right. all the disasters, right. the nuclear, nuclear war. And, how and do you at, get a cer at a certain moment, that opened the door to technology, because people cease to believe in God. And so they start thinking, well, we can't depend on God, and we don't know if there's a devil or not. Maybe there is, probably there is, who knows. But one thing we can count on is technology. So technology is taking over the universe now, the, the earthly universe. And, and, but, but, and you, are ra you are raging against it when it comes to appropriating what you see as the role of the creator. Yes, yes, yeah. Because finally technology is committee work. There are individual creators <laughs> in technology, yes. but generally speaking, 99 out of 100 new things that come along came along through the work of many fairly good committees if it's good, a good job. Mm -hmm. But technology has one thing it says over and over and over to people. It says, technology says to people, I'll give you more power, right. but less pleasure. And the modern life, I would argue, has less immediate sensuous pleasure than the life even that I remember from 50 years ago. I say that again? Life is less pleasant now, but more powerful. People yeah, have more right, individual right, power, right, but they right. have less pleasure. And that's the price you pay for technology. I mean, a simple that, phone call in the old days when you, you could flirt or scold the telephone operator on the line and no, knew she was listening in. Yes. Now what you've got is those menus. If it's <laughs> the least bit hard of hearing, you're gone. You turn to your children, you turn yeah. to the nearest person, you say, would you please listen to this telephone because I can't make out the menu. What do you regret most? Oh, the answer was there in the beginning. Not writing. Not that writing great a great novel. novel. Okay, so that's what you regret. <laughs> but I look, mean, not, not anything else, though? I mean, would you, 
Oh, a hundred things, a hundred really? things, hundred mistakes, hundred errors, a hundred foolishnesses. Of course. Yeah. I mean, are you? Uh, would you? Who would you call on your deathbed and say, "I, I got to call you and tell you this. I'm sorry." If I knew the answer, I wouldn't tell you. You would not. No. It's Why too, not? Too, too, too private. Too, too private and personal and yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. If you felt that profound about it, I would say, "Why don't you do it now?" Why, why, should, why don't I do it now? Yeah, well, in other words, if you on said TV, to me... You, yes, no, no, me, no, 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 I would say... Give me a phone, no, I'll make a call. No, 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 no. I would say to you, you should do it, if you told me that, and said I... You know, well, you're from North Carolina, well, that's and you're, you're a church marlin, when you scratch. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> Just about. <laughs> um, so, what, tell me about, this, we've been talking all around this, some thoughts on writing. Um, is it... Is it a learned craft? There's a lot of lore to writing. I know. And if you work and work and work at writing, you do get better and better, or should. And you do get, uh, you do get more wisdom about it. But you know, if we, we, if we see a fine cabinet maker, or a fine uh, uh, sh uh, uh, shoemaker, just those simple things, if they're really good, it means that they know things they can hardly communicate. And the same is true of writing. And uh, it isn't that I sat down and wrote this book and just said, all right, I'm going to offer all my wisdom and no, lore no, to the reader. Uh, a fine friend of mine named Michael Lennon, who knows more about my work than I do, uh, came to me one day, we were talking, and he said, do you know how much you've written about writing? And I said, no, come on. He said, you've been doing interviews for 40 years, and you have many, many remarks about writing. Including with me. Yes. A lot yes, of yes. them. Oh, you're in the book, aren't you? Yes. Yes, good. Good. <laughs> good, I remembered. <laughs> Now, the, the uh, oh, no, but then I took these remarks, yeah. and um, he he culled out about 900. We then broke it down to about 250, yeah. and then I started working on them and trying to find a pattern. It was like editing a movie. It was wonderful. Instead of using film script, I was using paragraphs, prose, yeah, right? A couple of sentences, uh, a paragraph, sometimes a page, sometimes an essay, and moving them around to try to get a coherence to it, which I believe I got to some extent in this book. You, you did, but you dedicated this book to Michael Lennon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he deserves it. Without him, this book wouldn't have been there. Yeah, but generally you don't dedicate it to somebody like that. You generally dedicate it to somebody... Well, he's, he's an old friend. He started yeah. an archive for me Yeah. about 20 years ago. Uh, without him, my old manuscripts would be moldering in wet cartons on some floor. I'm going to take you back to some years. In 1958, you said you would, quote, you know you said this, you would settle for nothing less than making a revolution in the consciousness of our time. Yes, I said that. And um, uh, perhaps I made a few skirmishes in the consciousness of our time. Um, I think the consciousness of our time has gotten worse and worse and worse. I've seen America become less noble, less exciting as a country, more loutish, yeah. uh, more corporate-driven. Uh, there are all sorts of wonderful developments in American life, but I think they're outweighed by the negativities. And I think that... This, well, tell this, me what the negative well, are in terms of those you just cited, whether it's the corporateness, of, it's the technology, it's... The number one, number one is, is, is the business of the war in Iraq. The arguments that are being used for it, they're absurd arguments. Which ones are absurd? I mean, Saddam Hussein well, but, but, might be the worst... What? Okay, go ahead. Well, Saddam Hussein might be the worst guy that's come along since Hitler. And Stalin. But, yeah. what? And Stalin. Yeah, I'm, all right, I'm, all right. I'm not quarreling with you. But he... Uh, he does not c command a powerful country. Yes, he's got poison gases of all sorts. Uh, yes, it's a danger. We live with these dangers in every country in every way. Just think of the countries that think, how much poison gas does America have? There's no thought at all that the idea behind it is we know what to do with poison gas, but these other people don't. Well, I Which think is the, American arrogance. Ah, but I, I think that it is American arrogance, but at the same time, uh, there is a reason. I mean, I think this is a noble country, and you don't. No, I put it a different way entirely. This Bad is, word, this is a democratic country. It clearly is that. And de democracy is noble, and yes. because it's noble, it's always endangered. Nobility is always endangered, and we have a, dem a democracy is perishable. The natural, I think, the natural government for most people, given the perversities and the depths of human nature and the ugly depths, is fascism. Fascism is a natural state. For because society. people want to be told what to do, or because because it's easier. Easier, exactly. It's easier, and if you have resentment, your resentment can be focused. The hardest thing in democracy yeah. is knowing whether your resentment has any point to it or not. But 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 just think about that for a second. I guarantee you that if in fact they topple Saddam Hussein, yeah, if it comes to that, yeah. 
one way or the other. Good, let's speculate on what happens. Because the they're going to, if they do it, they'll win the war easily. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and maybe he'll, some of his soldiers will take up yeah. arms against him. Maybe he will flee at the last moment. We don't know. It doesn't matter but how it turns out. My point is that know. the people of that country will be cheering on the streets some of them of will. Baghdad. Some most of them, of them some will. Of them will. Most of them will. We don't know. We don't know for sure. It doesn't matter, by the way. You think most of the people Listen, in I'm Germany not, like... I'm not interested in whether the majority of people in Iraq want a new government or not, even if they want a new one. What I'm interested in is not starting something that you can't finish. You're interested in that idea? No, I'm worried by that we're starting something we can't finish without changing the nature of American democracy by the time we're done. How will, how, let's uh, stop there. How will this change the nature of American do democracy if, in fact, uh, they don't finish it, or if they do finish it? You're saying finishing it will change let, the let American democracy. Let me ask democracy. you a simple question. All right. How did the war in Vietnam change the nature of American democracy? I'll tell you how it did. It, American democracy? Yeah. Amer uh, how did it change America? You're going to say to me the war in Vietnam did not change America? Um, no, I'm not. Of course not. It, it made us more loudish than nothing else. You had a lot of soldiers over there. A lot of soldiers over there who began to realize the idiocy of that war, and they began to realize that drink and pot were the only way to fight that war. Right. And so it became a wilder war than the war I was in. And they came back with that. And the very people who decry uh, the way the drugs are on the upbeat now in America all over the place, and the children can't read and stuff like that, are precisely the people who now are pushing to have a war in Iraq that could endanger things even more because there's such a disbelief in, in the need for this war. Let, let me just try to make my point on this. We could defeat Saddam Hussein very easily. But afterward, what? What makes terrorists? What makes terrorists is not, what makes terrorists is a feeling that they are a minority, that they're ready to die for their ideas. You could, uh, in no, a, that, in a, that, that, that's not what, I mean, the, the question really is what makes them feel that way. I mean, they become terrorists because they feel such rage against something for some reason. Yes, but the rage they feel is not because they live in totalitarian societies. It the is. rage they feel is that we are dominating them. Or not us, somebody. Somebody. Yes, but if we want to step forward and say we're the somebody, we're asking yeah. for I mean, it. We weren't dominating. Right. So we weren't dominating anyway, Osama my, bin Laden. Argument, somebody else was dominating. My argument comes down to this. If we're going to, um, how much time do we have left? Because I really want to be able to make this argument or uh, else. Well, you have enough time to make this argument for sure. All right. If it takes 30 minutes, make it. No, then I lose everything I said about my book, which is why I'm here in the first place. <laughs> I promise you both will be in. You can't have an hour. I'm not well, equal to an hour of American television time. We'll see about He said that. modestly. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Lying in his teeth. And, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and I say immodestly, it's my call. Well, subject to greater powers, <laughs> it's your call. <laughs> Make the point. Yeah, I'm 80 years old. I That's may have forgotten the point. <laughs> no, you haven't. No, I haven't. Point, go ahead. Let me try to make the point. The fact that Saddam Hussein is a monster, that he's terrorized a country, that he has very dangerous weapons, is a terribly unpleasant fact of life. In terms of the body politic, it's like having a hideous ulcer in your leg. But that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to attack that ulcer with all the means possible because the consequences might be worse. Part of living in, in a modern technological world with huge divisions is being able to stand the tension. If Saddam Hussein were ever to attack directly, he's gone, he's toast. So the next argument has been that he is encouraging terrorists all over the world. Well, if I were Saddam Hussein, as a novelist I speak now, the last person I'd want to come into my country <laughs> is a terrorist I don't control. And how do you control terrorists? They're always in small groups. If I were a terrorist, the last country I'd want to pass through is Iraq. If I'm going from Afghanistan or Pakistan all the way across the Near East mm. to, say, Libya, the country I would try to avoid is Iraq, because there they put me in an internment camp. They don't want loose kinds. Saddam Hussein's attitude is, I am the only terrorist in this country. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want... I don't want loose cannons, and I don't want aficionados. And, and, and you, are at lo you are alive in my country at my yes, sufferance. Yeah. So the argument that they are breeding terrorists is, I think, a weak argument. There's been no proof that they're breeding terrorists. It's all been loose and vague. Uh, That's not the argument against right, Saddam The other Hussein. argument is this. If this guy is mad enough and bad enough to drop siren gas on any country around, 
before a war. What do you think he's going to do in the last stages of the war? If he's going down and he's still alive and he's strong enough because we don't really know his final strength, his real, his metal, his, his, his lividity, his evil, to use George Bush's favorite word about which he knows very little. Uh, if he is going down in flames, why doesn't he pull the pillars of the temple down with him? He will. He will. So in other words, there's a real chance. He will try. He will try. He'll try. And it doesn't we, mean he'll be successful. But, and, but the and we with our extraordinary but, intelligence but the, the will know exactly the moment when he's going to try. No, huh? no, but the argument is, why are you so confident he won't do it anyway? And that's the question. If, in fact, he has that potential, he might do it anyway. I I'm not arguing for war. I'm just uh, trying to yeah. argue I, with you. I think, I think it's a weaker argument than that he would do it in defeat. To do it while he still retains power means the end of his power. Well, but he's already done it in part against his own people, and you know that. It's easy to do it against your own people. It's much easier to fight with your own mates than to go into a bar and have a fight with someone who's bigger than yourself. So, so you know what that is? That's an argument That's that North he... Carolina wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> That's an argument that he is, de he is deterrable. The idea is, here's an idea that many people talk about. Saddam Hussein is deterrable. Yes. In other words, you can deter him yeah. as we deter the Russians, the Russians deterred us, right? Yeah. Okay. And the idea is that the people who are with Osama bin Laden are not deterrable. That's they right. are prepared to die. Yes, yes. As yeah. they have witnessed time after time, you yes. know, especially tragically on September 11th. Yes. So, but we don't get them by taking him on. We are taking him on because we couldn't get them. That's my political argument. Does the Th this this is a sh shell game, and, I, I and but I don't they move the pea yeah, from one yeah, shell yeah, to yeah, another. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Th this is not. A, I don't think this is about the fact that he is somehow linked with them. Uh, the administration will argue that there is a connection, but I don't think that's the driving force for the reason that they believe they ought to. They have to do something, and they have to disarm him. Choose the word. They've got to disarm him. They believe that because he has shown such tendencies in terms of what he has done. Kuwait was not his own people. That was you're, a neighboring country. You're talking about 10 years ago, he attacked a country I'm smaller, about history. smaller than I, himself because he miscalculated grievously. Yeah. We're talking about something that in the last 10 years, he hasn't done it. May I offer you an argument why I think we're going to Iraq? Because no one can say really why we're going there. Don't There's tell no, me oil. If you do, I'll be disappointed in you. I don't want, wish to disappoint you and I have no desire to. I think the oil is an added advantage. It, it's a, As it's Kissinger a, used to say, it has the added advantage of being true. true. I know. Yeah. Okay. All right. I agree with that. I mean, there's no doubt that the oil is an element. That's been not, why, no, that's not, not why they're okay. doing it. Once they have defeated Iraq, oil becomes very large because then they have a, they have a restless Absolutely. grip on Saudi Arabia. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I'm with you on that. Okay. No, the reason that they are doing it is because they want to change the nature of American life. No, they want to change the nature of Middle, Middle Eastern life is All the reason right, they're doing great, it. Great, but let me say this. You can't inject democracies into countries that don't have it. This is one of the great... Okay, now you're on to something. Yeah, maybe. Maybe <laughs> indeed. Because democracy comes out of many subtle individual human battles that are fought over decades and finally over centuries and builds traditions. The, great, the only defense of democracy finally are the traditions of democracy. And when you start uprooting these traditions... You're playing with a noble and delicate structure. There's nothing more beautiful than democracy. Exactly. But you can't play with it. You can't assume we're going to go over and we're going to show them what a great right. system right. we right. have. Right. Right. And this is monstrous arrogance. It is. At a high I level. couldn't agree more. That idea that somehow we can impose our system anywhere in the world uh, is the arrogance. Or that we ought to try to create any other place in our own image. Exactly. It's because hubris. It's hubris. It, it is hubris. It is. Uh, well, that I would rest my case and get back to my book. <laughs> All right, I'm back to your book. All right. Um, the m film. You were at one time obsessed, romanticized yeah. by film. Did you lose that curiosity or did you say, I can't be great at that, so I'm back to what I can be great at and I'll take or I'm more likely can be great at this. The difference between film and, and, and literature is you can write a couple of books and they're half good and half bad, and you can keep at it. The economics are not uh, right, right, punitive right, right, right. that way. In film, you have to have a success sooner or later or you can't go on. 
agree. The other and I did not have the success I was looking for. If if my movie Tough Guys Don't Dance had been box office, hmm. I'd probably still be making movies, even though I'd be too old really to be a director. So are you saying that I you were at one movies. point in your life prepared? I'm prepared to leave one of the muses for another. Yes. Were you really? Yeah, yeah. You would have left. Making you would have left. I love making You just movies. described to me in the first part of this interview the most noble <laughs> calling was to write a novel and you're going to abandon it for the, for the you know, glitter of film. You know, there are men who have been known to leave a good woman for a bad woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> Probably more of them than we know. <laughs> That's true. That's right. <laughs> right. Leave, a bad, leave a bad woman for a good woman. I would, I would for not. Women. I would still have felt. Does vice versa mean there are women who've left a bad man for a good man? Or, yes. or does it mean that. Or, no, or, 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 or leave, leave, left, leave a bad woman for a good woman. Okay, yeah, right, right, right. right. No, no. But the, uh, the, the element there is very simply. Sorry, I'm such a sidewalker. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> is, is that I always thought the novel was more noble than film. Yes. I just thought film was more fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was more sexy. It, it more, had more of an, a... More, more power. More power. I mean, you more were like celebrated. A, you were like a general... One favorite story of mine <laughs> yes. over the years is I've had six wives, and each one of them, I'd say, honey, I'd like you to put a little curl in your hair, and they'd always say, get lost. <laughs> Then I became a director. They bring up Isabella Rossellini. I turn to the hairdresser. I say, I like a little curl in her hair. They say, Presto. yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> See, I thought you'd say that's the difference. The difference in making films and writing a novel is that you can go sit at this table and write a novel inside your head. Yeah. You yeah. can't make a film inside your head. No. You've got to have a bunch of collaborators. It's a very different intellectual Absolutely. and creative process. But I love that. You see, I've been alone all those years yeah. at the desk. And the idea of being able to work with a team and work fairly well was so exciting. It was a different life altogether. It didn't use the same talents all, at all. i tell you what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to invite you back, and we're going to finish this conversation. We are 36 minutes into it, all right. uh, and I have other commitments. Yeah, sure. Good. Uh, all right. I'll tell you when I'm back, because I'm going right up tonight all right. to um, see you, Norris. Uh, I'll be we're back. We're still on the air. What? We're still on the air. Oh, well, in any event, I'll be back on the 18th. Okay, we will do it again. We'll pick up on where we are. Okay. Uh, because I, I, I got other things I need to do. Yeah, sure. And, and we've been 37 minutes, and we shouldn't edit any of this, should we? I hope not. It's I would been think fun, so. really. Thank you. Norman Mailer, The Spooky Art, uh, some thoughts on writing. Uh, he is one of our best. In his own mind, perhaps the best. Perhaps in the mind of many reviewers, the best. He's certainly one of the three or four. Could I add a coda? Yes. Uh, there are 20 writers in America right now who think they're the best. <laughs> and yes, I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.